Sometimes it's important, and even productive, to question your own assumptions, to stress test your views and interpretations, and it's in that spirit that I decided to range through some notions that have more or less hardened in my mind about the state of modern Hollywood and things being better back in the day, and subject them to a bit of good old-fashioned evaluation. Bear in mind, this is the internet, and someone assessing their views is about as rare as a positive review of Velma. So strap in, because straw men are going to be coming at us thick and fast as the cordyceps infected zombies in The Last of Us. Firstly, wasn't there an amazing amount of garbage back in the day? Absolutely. In fact, pound for pound, minute for minute, modern entertainment and the expanse of choices and streaming are probably substantially better today. The difference is, on the high end back in the 80s and 90s, the upper tier of mainstream entertainment, an overall tier of high-end stuff, there was an abundance of and mindset towards originality. And when there were remakes or adaptations, they were transposed and reimagined in extraordinary ways, to the extent they thrived as virtual standalone works that were original in their own right. For me, the ideal analogy would be that the 80s and 90s were like a Rolling Stones album. Now, the Rolling Stones are arguably the greatest rock and roll band of all time, but a typical Rolling Stones album, at their height, would have a couple of average Delta Blues tracks, a couple of forgettable Chicago Blues tracks, a couple of sleazy throwaway rockers, and one or two other jams. But there would always be a Can't Always Get What You Want or Brown Sugar, which were monumentally cool and destined to stand the test of time. The modern age is like, well, a modern album, slickly produced and engineered, auto-tuned, full of guest artists, consistently decent quality through all the songs, but not especially visceral, game-changing, or enduring. Now, you could say that if you had modern streaming shows playing on 80s or 90s TV, people would have been blown away. If, right after watching Dallas or MacGyver, you found yourself watching House of the Dragon, I'm sure it would have been amazing. So, generally speaking, I think this argument is true. But this doesn't negate the overall argument about the top 10% of content between the eras. Also, Emily in Paris, or Ted Lasso, or Slow Horses, would have led many people back in the day to flick over to the A-Team or Miami Vice. Another important consideration is that, if the 80s and 90s had delved into and rehashed the 60s and 70s to anywhere near the extent the present day dredges up the 80s and 90s, then the 80s and 90s would have been almost unimaginably dire and dull. Next, a quick look at the Oscar-nominated best films over the last decade shows there's outstanding work. Unquestionably, Sam Mendes producing 1917, Quentin Tarantino's Once Upon a Time in Hollywood, Bong Joon-ho's Parasite, Todd Phillips' Joker, all outstanding and enduring. In fact, on this level, I would say the advances in cinematography, the artistry of modern productions, the composers embellishing films with scores rich with symphonic textures and electronic synths, the diversified range of stories being told, all of it has made the extreme high end as enjoyable and fulfilling as it's ever been. But we're talking about a minuscule sliver of the overall output in any given year, and it's only one factor to take into account. Besides, there has never been a bigger disconnect between those high-end, award-worthy films and the general viewing public. Typical engagement with the world of entertainment encompassed the whole thing, and it's the mainstream entertainment, particularly in streaming, which people consume in their day-to-day -day lives, and which shapes their overall perception of the culture. It's also often stated, quite rightly, with many modern directors that there is a missing element that goes right to the heart of cinema itself. Heart and soul. Christopher Nolan is extraordinary, but people often come away from his films feeling a little cold. There is a feeling they are too cerebral, conceptual, and that attempts at heart and spirit feel contrived and concessionary, and jarringly imposed as a sop to mainstream sensibilities. Todd Field, with a film like Tar, gives us something almost overly austere, that, in attempting to be uncompromisingly sophisticated, is divested entirely of warmth and pathos. The same goes for Denis Villeneuve, capable of often breathtaking visuals and set pieces, but whose work lacks some essential element of cinematic enthralling engagement. The work is masterful, but somehow emotionally inert. Lastly, even at this high end, it isn't clear if modern directors are capable of works that cause a cultural sensation, a lines-around-the-block cultural phenomenon like Star Wars. Next, what about the amazing new levels of visuals in tentpole films? 
Those visuals can be captivating, but there's a strange disconnect where people don't seem to laud the efforts of those hundreds of VX designers all that much. One reason is, the films are so unaccountably long that either the extraordinary multiverse madness visuals make up a small percentage of two and a half hour long blockbusters, or there's too much of it, and after booming sub-bass, swirling camera work, candy colours, soulless green screen and frenetic action, the impressive CGI visuals just don't leave that much of an impression. Lastly, with average screenwriting, flat character development, and larger issues about studios like Marvel being too bloated, centerless, directionless, and flinging too much content at everyone's screens, these wider complications, leaving many viewers indifferent to the overall product, somewhat overshadow the technical achievements in action sequences. Besides, good old-fashioned practical effects will always be more impactful, because the realism of density, lighting, texture, and weight is more engaging. Reimagining classic 80s films with CGI replacing the practical effects would almost doesn't bear thinking about. Next, am I focusing on the crappy lower-end identity politics stuff too much and missing the bigger picture? Honestly, thinking about this, my feeling is no. There is a massive, frustrating amount of content that is offensively bad in its presumption, self-inserts, screenwriters feeling that properties they had nothing to do with dreaming up ought to be transmuted to reflect their own lives and circumstances, using ostensible progressive diversity as a means to egotistically forefront themselves. With this has come a culture of antagonism, division, of traditional long-standing fan bases who are often written off as reactionary, Incongruous casting, where diverse actors and actresses appear in contexts that make no sense historically. Shows with meta-comedy intended to convey self-awareness, but which isn't sophisticated enough to control the irony. Disproportionate empowerment of female characters, who come across as overpowered, grating, and pert, and male characters who are underdeveloped, banal, and benign. If you're getting a procession of almost overlapping shows, like The Rings of Power, She-Hulk, Willow, The Witcher, Blood Origin, and Velma, then it's fair to say that this crappy, culture war, identity politics riven stuff is very much a key element of the bigger picture. So, after questioning my assumptions, the recurring issues and frustrations I've been raising for a year or so, I feel as strongly as I ever have that modern Hollywood is in a right state, is in the midst of an awful error, and that it matters to do deep dives into why. So, if you've suffered this far with my commentary, settle in to suffer more, because we've got a long ways to go.